Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Today on Another View, our roundtable pundits are ready to tear down some prevailing thoughts, myths, if you will, that continue to be attached to being African-American in our country, even though time and time again, conventional wisdom has been proven wrong. We're talking about beliefs that just won't go away, even down to whether or not black people feel pain differently than whites. Roger Chesley, Carol Pretlow, Bill Thomas, and guest pundit Delcino Miles are here with their pet peeves about how others perceive the black community. The mythology of being African American is next on Another View, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Before we start today's show, our heartfelt condolences to the family of State Senator John Miller. Um, John Miller was an employee here at WHRO. I also worked with him as a journalist um, during the 90s when I was at WTKR. He's a great friend of ours, of all of us, and uh, we want to wish his family and all of um, of Virginia, um, who is... Um, uh, offering their condolences today. Uh, as a matter of fact, his service is going on as we speak. So we offer our condolences to him. We also want to say congratulations to the 2016 Humanitarian Award winners. The Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities held their event last night. And uh, Charles Barker, Bishop B. Courtney McBath, Cindy Cutler, Alvin Wall, Voices of Faith, and Birth of an Answer were all recipients of uh, their Humanitarian Awards um, for work that they've done in the community to try to bring inclusion to our community. And a final thanks to those of you who came out on Tuesday night for our final race. Let's talk about it. Uh, town hall meeting. The conversation was about race and religion. I think we had just about every race of uh, every religion represented uh, in the group and it was a great conversation. So we thank you so much for participating. We'll, we will start up again next fall and we'll keep you posted on that. So today we're going to talk about perceptions of the African-American community that just will not go away, even though through statistics, science, fact, and any other way you look at it that says otherwise, conventional wisdom continues to deem that it's true. This idea came to me after reading a Washington Post article this week about being black and having pain, but we'll get to that after we meet our panelists. Roger Chesley is a columnist for the Virginian Pilot, and you can read his columns every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Hey, Roger. Hello, Barbara. I didn't know you were such a fan of Earth, Wind, and Fire there at the start. Yeah, I know. Just before the show started. How about that? (laughs) Carol Pretlow is a professor of political science at Norfolk State University. Hi, Carol. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> How are you doing today? <laughs> Wonderful. Good. Thanks for being with us. Our favorite community activist is Mr. Bill Thomas. How are you doing, Bill? Uh, I'm good, but I also just want to accentuate what you said about Senator John mm-hmm. Miller, a very, very decent man. I've known him for 30 years in broadcasting mm-hmm. when I was with WNIS and WTKR. <laughs> and uh, I had a chance to speak with his wife, Sharon, and his sister and his, mo- and his mom, who's still, mm-hmm. still very, very active and uh, just shows you if you have people with courage and people that – don't put political persuasion on things that can just act right and do the most decent thing. Uh, Senator uh, was just Miller was one of those gentlemen, Absolutely. a Virginia gentleman. Thank you. Rest Thank in you, peace, Bill. sir. Absolutely. Rest in peace. And joining us today, our guest pundit, Ms. Delcino Miles. She's owner of the Miles Agency, a PR niche marketing firm, which is arguably the oldest black PR firm in Virginia. Delcino <laughs> has worked on branding and marketing for national, <laughs> regional, and local companies, as well as nonprofits. And she also teaches at Regent University. Hey, Delcino. Hey, Ms. <laughs> See, she already fits in. <laughs> what, what religion are you teaching? I did not Ooh, say she taught religion. religion. <laughs> Just, uh, 
<laughs> you, would you like to tell Mr. Thomas what you teach at Regent? Marketing and public relations. <laughs> religious. Okay. That's religion. <laughs> <laughs> That's big okay. time religion. Okay. All right, so let's let's get started because Roger actually is the catalyst behind this. He sent out an article this week, and I want our audience to understand that even though the roundtable only comes together once a month on the air, we do communicate all month long with various articles and topics and things of interest. And so a Washington Post article says that African Americans are routinely undertreated for pain compared to whites, according to research done by the University of Virginia. The study questioned a general group of white people and then white first, second, third, and resident medical students. So there were two groups Mm -hmm. that they looked at. One of the findings, for example, is that many of the white medical students and residents in the study believe that blacks have less sensitive nerve endings than whites or that black people's blood coagulates more quickly. There was another study done by Emory University in Atlanta that found that 74% of white patients with bone fractures received painkillers compared with only 50% of black patients. And yet another study found that black children with appendicitis were less likely to receive pain medication than their white counterparts. And all of these studies concluded that unconscious stereotypes of African-Americans contribute to the way that doctors treat African-American patients. Roger? (laughs) It's one of of those things that just makes your jaw drop. And you, I, I think the thing that was the most disturbing to me about this is the study of the folks who were studying to be, the, the, the results from the folks who were studying to be doctors. I mean, if anybody's supposed to know this already, it should have been them. You, you, might, you might be able to excuse folks who weren't in the medical field, but how can you excuse this if this is the profession that you're supposed to be going in and you don't know the difference? And I, and I think two things, and, and we discussed this beforehand, uh, Barbara was the the sense that either a there's some notion that black folks are superhuman, or b maybe the one that's even more damning is that we're inhuman, that we don't really need this help. We don't we don't really need this. Uh, uh, let me let me bring any you of one, one of the other things that came out of the study. So it, of the general group of people, not doctors, 58 percent believe that black skin is thicker than whites. OK. Mm-hmm. All right. We get that from general sin. First year medical students, 40 <laughs> percent believed it. Second year medical students, 42 percent believed it. Mm-hmm. Third year medical students, 22 percent. And residents, people who treat you in the emergency room, right. 25%. Delcina. Uh, residents, they finish school. These are scientists. Uh, they're scientists what? by nature and by study. So it's disturbing that they have that stereotype. I'm not surprised, but it's still nevertheless just as disturbing. Um, so it makes me wonder, uh, well, well, I purposely seek out African-American doctors for for that, not because of the study, mm-hmm. but because one, I, um, I'm more comfortable, they understand my culture, and they know what questions to ask. Uh, and I don't think this would go into it, these factors. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm not one of the types that says, well, you know, white doctors are better than black doctors. We have that stereotype <laughs> within our own oh, community. Yes. So that we won't support uh, African-American um, a physician because for some reason they're inferior. Right. We think they're not as educated. That, they're that, not as. That's right. Yeah. So that, that's, that's worse. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, but for these um, doctors coming and I don't know what year this study was. Um, this is just, it just the, came the out. The most recent study yeah. just came out. 2015 or so. One, yes. Um, mm-hmm. So, so these are doctors that are new in the profession and going out there now. Um, so it makes me wonder what kind of care are they giving their, their black patients? Um, and, these are the same folks who are going to build insurance companies the same, probably the same uh, rate. Uh, <laughs> so is there discrimination there? Um, uh, or are they providing unnecessary treatment to African Americans for the billing? Well, the same thing, Bill. Oh, I agree. And, and if, you look at, if you look at the different issues related to the statistics, uh, black men, like the two of us, are 70% more likely to die from prostate cancer than white men. Mm-hmm. Black women are, even though you have lower diagnosis for breast cancer, are 60% more likely to die than white women. I even had a personal experience. So it's, this is a history of this. It's, it's clearly what our first child had issues being born. 
uh, we moved from Cleveland to Shaker Heights, went to a an, white an facility and suffered horribly for it. Uh, so this is nothing new. The statistics spell it out. Just as an example, from a personal, not a personal, but from a business standpoint, cancer in Virginia is going to increase 36 percent over the next five years. For black folks, it's going to increase 80 percent. Portsmouth leads the, the yeah, state and, 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 and all the other, the city of Hampton leads in an incident of cancer. Still, when we try to do things to particularly target African-American mm -hmm. community, not only does the government not give us more resources, they take the resources away. Mm -hmm. So this is nothing more than data point proof that what the numbers say are actually true. There is institutionalized racism throughout the American system of finance, health, education, and nothing, unfortunately, nothing has really been done to dent the curve. Carol, let me read yes. one of the statistics, and this will play kind of into our next topic also. But the, according to the study, black couples are significantly more fertile than white couples. Now, 17 percent of the general population <laughs> believes that 10 percent of first year med students, 15 percent of second year med students. 2% of third-year med students, 7% of residents. They obviously aren't treating the Kennedys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just saying. Or the McCoys. I, I am Virginia. speechless because I would think that even if they went into medical school with some preconceived stereotypical notions, that their studies, their scientific background, and all of that would 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 kick in and then they would see that this is not true. And so it, it amazes me. I mean, I can understand maybe there is a lack of information once you graduate from college and go to medical school, but once you get in and you are involved in the process of scientific research and scientific applications, then there should be a change. You know, it's kind of interesting because as you look at each of the categories, um, and this article is from the Washington Post mm -hmm. that, that came, yeah. but if you look at each of the categories, the numbers between the first year and second year a lot of times go up yeah. as Ooh. opposed to going down, which really makes you also wonder, Roger, what are they teaching? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you wonder that, and you wonder what they're not getting uh, leading up to medical school, but definitely what's happening after they get to medical school. I, I just wanted to relay a, an issue that uh, my wife and I go through with our older daughter. She has sickle cell disease. And, you know, she got very good care here at Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the main physicians there, Dr. Owen, he's white, and he gave her excellent care. But one of the things now that she's aged out of that of uh, PD, now she's no longer a, in the pediatric care, mm -hmm. we're finding it is not the same uh, concentration of care Absolutely. among adults. Mm -hmm. And so we're very concerned as she continues her education, she's now going get, to get ready to work on a PhD, where she goes, is she going to be able to get the same type of care, the same type of sensitivity? And, th and this goes beyond whether you have these myths. This is just uh, a question of... Yeah knowledge of, of the Reality. different diseases that yeah. we might have mm -hmm. as, as a people and that we might be genetically predisposed to, um, to have. Okay. The, the, the issue is even more strikingly important, I'm sure Roger will catch up with it during the next General Assembly, which we're going to go through a thing called Certificate of Public Need. Mm -hmm. And basically the hospitals pr uh, give free care to indigents. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Republican-led uh, house want to make medicine market driven. So they will eliminate the certificate of public need. So when, when you look at all of these things that are dr dramatically targeting, whether by supposition or just by happen chance, our people, our leaders aren't identifying these issues. Let them get rid of certificate of public need, lay it on the top of an institutionalized issue related to care and the health and the consideration of humanity among African Americans by the very professionals and scientists, this curve is just going to keep going up where we're going to continue to suffer. And if the numbers for men like Roger and myself with cancer, it's going to be, we're going to be 70% likely, to, we're mm -hmm. not going to be because we're in the income group that's going to get us out of that. We're going to be 70, 75% more likely to die from cancer, which is going to increase 
35% over the next five years in Virginia, and we're going to take whatever little support that we have away from those in most need, the mm-hmm. indigent. Well, and mm-hmm. when you look at the fact that most um, poor um, people in general, use use the emergency room right. as their primary place care. of primary, primary care. care. And most of your residents work in there. your emergency rooms. <laughs> yeah. There it, you go. It, it gets a little scary. Let's talk to Matt in Virginia Beach. Hi, Matt. You're on the air. Hi there. Um, when I learned earlier about these findings this week, uh, I was quite shocked. And clearly, it's a, it's a matter of people bringing their racist views with them into uh, their training and leaving without being disabused of them. But I would like to point out one thing. When you talk about these people being uh, scientists, you know, the, the, the people with PhDs in biology and so forth, uh, they're, they're doing science. M- medical doctors are practitioners. I mean, they are quite literally still applying leeches and drilling holes in people's heads. So to, 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 I just want to point out that the notion that they're scientists or they shouldn't have these views is, is actually quite flawed. They're not really scientists. They're, they're practitioners of... Could I ask of, a question? Yeah. But do they not use their scientific skills to become excellent medical doctors? They don't, they don't by and large, have excellent scientific skills. They, 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 they study enough science to get into medical school, and then they're trained in how to actually practice medicine as an art, oh, not as well, a science. I don't know what school they're going okay. to. Well, thanks, Matt, for your call. Anybody else want to respond to him before we go on to our next topic? Well, go the ahead, only Brian. thing, I'd just uh, add as another personal note, and, and the, the story that when I passed along to you, it made me think of this incident when I was about 23, 24, had sprained my ankle in Detroit after playing basketball, thinking I could play. And <laughs> I remember going to the doctors, and I needed to get an x-ray. And the, the physician on duty, he didn't provide a wheelchair for me. He just basically said, oh, just, you, can, you can walk to where the room is. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I was young, stupid, and didn't make enough of a fuss at the time. But it, it bothered me in years, you know, after that. It was like, okay, so what superhuman strength am I supposed to have? You can see my ankle is swollen. Yeah. Uh, and you know that uh, I'm in pain. It, it, and it's just, you just wonder how much of this is uh, people not caring or, or something else more care. sinister. Okay. Well, Go Barbara, Go all right, fine. I mean, I'm not going to debate the part, you know, tomato, tomato. Um, mm-hmm. They do study science. Um, they they um, prescribe chemicals yes. for people to treat illness and treat disease. So you have to have some knowledge of, of, of science and chemistry and all of that. Second, um, there, I think it, hidden in there, too, is not so much what they're bringing to the table, but it's the, the bedside manner the, 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 that they're bringing into it. So, Roger, why wouldn't the doctor think twice about yeah. easing the, the, the suffering, suffering of a, of a patient? Absolutely. That is Absolutely. your task. Yeah. And uh, with the Hippocratic Oath, you know, Which you just don't want to do any harm. So if you're coming in with a harmful perspective on how to treat a patient because you're saying that your, thin is, your, thin, your skin, skin is, is thin. thicker, and this has nothing to do with politics. So, um, it, so you're saying that because you are predisposed to a certain way and you're going to look at me through that flawed lens, then my care is going to be different. Absolutely. With the same, with the same if, if, so if, uh, if a, a non-African-American, young, as Roger self-described, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm quoting here. I, I'm <laughs> much older now, thank you. So uh, the, uh, if he's coming in with the same condition, would he have offered a wheelchair? wheelchair to him. Absolutely. And that, yeah. That's where the difference comes in. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the second topic, um, and that is that there's a news anchor in Pittsburgh. Uh, her name is Wendy Bell. <laughs> And she was fired. Yeah. Um, was she fired? Yes, yes she, she was. was. Okay. Yes, she was right. fired. Okay. Yes. Um, after her comments that she posted on Facebook. Now, okay. she's an 18-year news veteran. Okay. Um, there was a mass shooting in, Pit- in the Pittsburgh neighborhood. There were six family members um, who died, including mm-hmm. a pregnant woman. Mm-hmm. And Wendy wrote a lot about her frustration um, about what, what happened and who was responsible for it. And I want to read just a little bit of what she said. And this is the thing that sent people in Pittsburgh, apparently, through the roof. Um, Quote, you needn't be a criminal profiler to draw a mental sketch of the killers who broke so many hearts two weeks ago Wednesday. I will tell you they live within five miles of Franklin Avenue and Ardmore Boulevard. They've been hiding out. Um, They are young black men, likely teens or in their early 20s. They have multiple siblings, 
from multiple fathers and their mothers work multiple jobs. These boys have been in the system before. They've grown up there. They know the police. They've been arrested. They've made the circuit and nothing has scared them enough. Now they are lost. Once you kill a neighbor's three children, two nieces and her unborn grandson, there is no coming back. Now the issue around this is that police had not put out any Mm -hmm. description (laughs) at all of who the suspects were. Um, and what was going on with that. So that was the first thing of of the posting that upset people. The second part of her post was that she went on to talk about how there was hope within the black community that she saw through a young African-American man, quote, hustling like nobody's business, unquote, in a restaurant where they were having dinner. She said the child stacked heavy glass glasses 10 high and carried three teetering towers of them in one hand with plates piled high in the other. He wiped off tables, tended to the chairs, got down on his hands and knees to pick up the scraps that had fallen on the floor. And he did all of this with a rhythm and a step that gushed positivity. He moved like a dancer with a satisfied smile on his face. And I couldn't take my eyes off him. He is going to make it. Who wants to start first? Carol, First of all, there's so many stereotypical comments they have. Then to assume, yes, okay, I I give it that this person is hardworking. But that does not mean that there are not other categories of people who are, are working hard within the black community. Third, she does not know the background of those specific individuals. And one background may be different from the other alleged um, perpetrators of the crime. Finally, um, her statements had so many component parts that that were stereotypes of the black community. I found that offensive in so many ways. Bill? Who did the murder? Did they eventually catch the folks? We, we, there's still a lot of people out there. Do, do you know, Roger, uh, have more? Well, what they're Roger saying now update. is that there are four um, uh, people who have been questioned one has been named a suspect. Uh, three black men, one black woman were the four that were, according to the pictures that I saw in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And this was in the last couple of days. And one of the injured is apparently the target, was the target of the shootings. Okay. And they're all African-American? Yes, I believe all. Yes, they are all African-American. All, all, the, all African the victims American. and the suspects. I, yeah. I, I just think that this is one of the reasons why, and I'm not endorsing Donald Trump or anything like that. But I'm, just, I'm endorsing don't. the frustration. I think what this woman said, and she may have stepped over the line a little bit by going and pres- presuming that this had happened. More than a little bit. Well, mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. well, 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 I, I don't think so. I, I truly don't. I just think that she took something to heart and wrote it down. Should have thought about it. Shouldn't have put it out there. But at the end of the day, whatever she speculated appears to be true. So... Uh, all of the murders. But, but, but okay, let me ask this question okay. then to, 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 and then Roger, I'm coming to right, you. Okay. But Bill, if you say then it appears to be true, but did she, no. I'm asking the question, by her writing it before she even had any proof but, of that. What's right? wrong? Is that it not wrong. a problem? That's, that's wrong. Yeah. That's wrong. Okay. That's wrong. And, that's and wrong. Goes, okay. Roger, as a journalist, and this is, especially if you are not uh a, a columnist, you are not mm-hmm. an editorial writer, right. you are supposed right. to, before you jump out there, uh, get some facts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. She's a TV anchor. She's been there for 18 years. She's supposed to know better. Even if those were her thoughts, it, it, she should have said, okay, what do the facts actually say? Where are we actually going with that? Um, I disagree. I, I would, you know, I would hate that she loses the job. However, I, I would also say th- her comments in general sold a, a, a certain lack of sensitivity, and a certain naivete. I mean, one of the things she said about the young man at the uh, restaurant was, I wonder if it was perhaps the only time he'd ever been hugged right. before. Yeah. Like when she went, made a lot of assumptions that she know, was a fatherless yeah. child. She, she knows probably, nothing about this young man. No, she, she knows nothing about this Anyhow, young man. So might come from a different family. One at a time, one at a time. And, you know, she doesn't know how much hugging he's getting or how much love that he's, you know, getting at home. And, wow. I, and I just thought that there was some, some leaps of uh, of thinking here that I'm not sure would have been uh, given to somebody else that she would have made that somebody else. Now, I think a suspension would have been fine. I wish she hadn't been fired. She has been at the station for 18 years. She'll go to Fox. Uh, She'll be on Fox News. 
Go ahead, Delcina. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's her Facebook post. She it's a rant. That's right. how I look. It was yeah. a rant. Yeah. Was it insensitive? Yes. Did she do it out of frustration and anger? Yes. Most likely. Is she a racist? Don't know. Uh, the comments were the comments in the in the context here that you read, Barbara. Mm-hmm. Sound racist? They do. Yes. Yeah, uh, I don't support this. I'm not defending what she wrote. Uh, I'd certainly defend her freedom to express herself. But to to as a journalist, a trained right. journalist with a, a seasoned journalist to, to make those statements before any evidence has mm-hmm. been put forth by law enforcement Fourth. is uh, reckless at best. And the, the thing uh-huh. about mm-hmm. they're within five miles of the of where the shooting took place. <laughs> How she know that? Where's that coming from? Well, it, it, what I took from it was was that this entire neighborhood, whatever that neighborhood was, that was. The issues, but but I see what you're saying now. The station, um, which is WTAE TV, um, mm-hmm. what they city? did. It's in, in the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh area. Pittsburgh. Okay. Pittsburgh. okay. Um, they posted oh, okay. um, and they made an apology. Wendy Bell posted a message on her Facebook page that mm-hmm. offended many of our viewers. Her post offended us. Wendy had since apologized, which she did for what she wrote and acknowledged it was insensitive. Wendy is sorry for the word she chose, and so are we. It was an egregious lack of judgment, but. Yeah. Again, it, having a professional journalist, words matter. Um, we had a discussion about this recently with um, a young girl in one of our public housing yeah. units was mm-hmm. shot, twelve year old, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and got and was shot. And the language used by officials and others to talk about it is was perpetrator and and victim, and they're words that. De- that some say dehumanize the community and and make them not necessarily well, well, real. I just wonder how you guys react to that. I don't know about you all know of that. that. I, okay. I think we've had we had two murders or shots being shot in Newport News this morning. A couple in Norfolk, one in Chesapeake. I mean, some of these communities are are out of control, out of order. I mean, and you know where they are. I mean, people just want to step on glasses or step. I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm not trying to say I'm better or anything else. Clearly, I'm not saying that. But I'm not going to shoot somebody who steps on my toe. I'm not going to put a 13-year-old or this fool that's being tried now for killing this one-year-old kid in Portsmouth or someplace. The other day, he's being tried now in Norfolk or someplace. I'm not going to do that kind of reckless behavior. I understand the frustration of this young lady. She pretty well much knows. Is this an all-black community that this, this stuff happened in? It's, it's, it's out of control. It's, it's, it's out of order. Why don't we try to work on that versus trying to, and I understand the professionalism, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not even going there with that. Mm-hmm. She, she, she blew it. She should have not done that. Hang but on, at the end of the day, right, okay. the, people right still got, the people are still getting killed. If you're just joining us, we're talking about prevailing myths about the African-American community with Roger Chesley, columnist for the Virginian Pilot, Carol Pretlow, political science professor with NSU, community activist Bill Thomas, and guest pundit Dulcino Miles, owner of the Miles Agency, a PR niche marketing firm. Roger. Yeah, but, and again, to the whole point of professionalism, I mean, I just did a column that was in yesterday's paper about an incident that took place in D.C. where a 17-year-old black black male shot a 15-year-old uh, black black boy at a metro station over a look. But I did some research on that. I actually reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office uh-huh. for the District of Columbia to, to get some statements on that. Uh-huh. Um, and... You have to be very careful about uh, overbroad, uninformed statements. I mean, we know there's a problem. We know that there are deficiencies. We know we kill each other at ridiculous rates. But what are we, you, you know, you don't have to throw gasoline on it. Then what do you, you do? Try to do? Nothing's it. happening. Not, what do you do? You do what Bill Clinton did? What, what do you well, do? Well, you try to suggest, I mean, one of the things I did in the conference yesterday, I, I, I wonder if we really understand where we came from and some of the I things that we're still that doing. And so, you know, I tried to, to, to turn it around at least a little bit and say, hey, maybe if we understood our history, maybe we understood our survival, mm-hmm. you know, maybe and we would I stop agree. doing this as much as is we did. And at least I think that that was something constructive. I didn't find anything constructive in in what this anchor did. Carol. Yeah, um I have a problem with it in so many ways. And first of all, these are alleged perpetrators and they do not become officially a um charge that's guilty until they go through the court system. And she's 
putting the cart before the wheel. She's <laughs> definitely over the line here. Delcina, I see you kind of grimacing a little bit. Well, <laughs> I hate to say this. I'm kind of leaning towards Bill here. Um, but <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I say okay. kind of. Give you. I kept my blood sugar a little low. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, that's my disclaimer, blood, low blood sugar. Uh, but th- there is a lot of anger out there. Um, and um, we, we're not, the black community is not disputing that we have issues. And, but she did this on her private Facebook page. Um, so I, I, and I agree with Roger that we, do, we shouldn't have, she shouldn't have lost her job over it. If anything, it, this, this it, is a it, learning it on, opportunity. It was on a station Facebook page. It wasn't yeah. on a private. Oh, it was on oh, a, it was it was a on, station. It was oh, a whole other thing. Whole yeah. other yeah. thing. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, but either way, before she had pressed send, you would think that she would have read over it or calmed down or, or something. She, this was a, a, a rant, and it was out of anger and frustration and the brutality of the crime. Yeah. Uh, children were well, slaughtered. I, but she even said that she waited a while right. before she she's still decided to write this, and then she went ahead. Go ahead, Roger. I, I don't mind the anger, but where's the con- where do you say something that's constructive or that actually helps? And then secondly, I don't know about you, uh, Delcino, but when I put stuff even on my personal Facebook page, yeah. I, I, I am very, uh, I try to be very uh, cognizant of what, what type write. of message I'm coming, because yeah. in a sense, I'm a, I'm a personality because my face is always in the paper, and my face is always on the What's online right? site. Right. And so, you think, and but Roger, are, and are we I'm, oversensitive about this stuff, though? Are we oversensitive? Are we uh, giving her more, uh, more of her 15 minutes than she deserves, quite frankly? Well, the fact is. Because this doesn't change the fact that some, a family was slaughtered. Absolutely. It, it, it doesn't change that at all. But what, what did she add to the conversation except something negative for herself and for the station? As you see it, a lot of people don't believe it's negative in what she did. I don't believe it's negative in what yeah, she I, did. Yeah, I read some of the, the posts to Post her sir, Facebook, sir. and it was about 50-50. I, yeah, I, don't, I don't agree with you on that point. I understand okay. the professionalism, but Hang what on. she said, I have no problem with Let's it. Let's talk to part. Lance from Portsmouth. Hi, Lance. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, afternoon, and thank you for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think she was very brave in her comments. Um, I believe she sympathized with the struggle going on in our community. She Amen. was appalled by the violence. And, you know, we have to stop uh, deflecting the conversation. Um, you know, we believe in personal liberties and people's right to speak out, and then she's criticized for it. Um, she felt like she was adding to the discussion and talking about a problem that we have and, and bringing attention to it. She wasn't trying to hurt anyone. Um, and she's being punished for it. And um, if you read the whole um, article, uh, you know, the media is giving excerpts of what she said, but if you read the whole article and take it in its full context, she was trying to bring light to a problem we have in our, our community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lance. Do you, I mean, do you guys agree with that? I totally agree. Do you with agree you. with that, Roger? I, I totally agree. I, I'm conflicted on it. I didn't, again, I didn't think that she should have been fired. I think she should have been suspended. And I actually uh, read there was uh, TribLive.com actually posted on March 30th the entire uh, yeah. post, which has since been deleted. Right. And I actually read it, and I, I just thought that she was more imprecise and naive. Not Emotional. necessarily... Not, not necessarily well, something that she was trying to be destructive, uh, but I would have thought better than for somebody who's been in the business at that station for 18 years, I would have thought she would have shown a little bit more sensitivity and a, a little bit more caution, too. Well, as a former news director, mm-hmm. you know, um, as a leader in the newsroom, um, I think that a I agree with you. I, I the the firing bothers me a little bit because I think they may have taken it a bit too far. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that the apology was necessary, and I do believe that that once again, as a news director, I would look at my newsroom them and say, "Do I need to come back with some more sensitivity training?" Because right. because what she said, it doesn't matter whether it was true or not, Bill, it was not her place. As a journalist, you're supposed to be Uh, about facts Mm -hmm. and objectives. And she was not objective. And she posted it on the station's Mm -hmm. Facebook page, which represents the station. (laughs) I'm feeling you, but here's what I'm saying as well. I wonder in her personal life if she's lost any relatives to violence. I wonder in her personal life. And it should be disconnected. Nobody is saying that. But rather than deflect the nonsense and the tragedy and the human life and toil that was 
the the actions of these folks who did this is reflected on her and and I just think the station did not be sensitive to her frustrations. I wondered if anybody said her. I love. I'm gonna try to call her. She's cute too. And <laughs> and the C. Okay. Married with five kids. Okay. Married with five kids. Married with five children. And no job. And no job. <laughs> and no job. No. Yeah. Okay. With that. Can with I, that. Can just like Rob, you had the last <laughs> comment on this. Else, you know, and, guys. and unfortunately, I think and what's uh, getting missed here is that you know a family was was basically decimated yes, in this. Yes. And you know you, five. Five people died. An unborn child died. Uh, three other My people goodness. seriously injured. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in fact, the it was uh, an awful thing. The, the yeah. target of this uh, apparently he has several bullets still left in his body. So wow. you know we're, we're talking about just a, a horrendous issue. And it, and it was. And and I understand that from that perspective why she wanted to weigh in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a a tape I'd like you all to listen to, and this is um, some different thoughts about mythology and being African American. things that black folk don't do. Black folk don't swim. Have eating disorders. Not only is that not true, but it's becoming increasingly not true. Black folk don't camp. We don't like animals. Well, we do like dogs. Black folks don't commit suicide. We have a line that we draw. Black folk don't do atheism. It's kind of like their dirty little secret. Blackness is portable. We don't lose it when we go do some stuff that black folk don't do. Black folk don't get married. <laughs> that question got me a little nervous in me. If there's 40 million black people, there's 40 million ways to be black. Is that not the ultimate point that there are 40 million black <laughs> people and there are 40 million exactly. different ways mm-hmm. to be black? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's true, true of all races. No, that's yeah. true. <laughs> We don't all know each other. No, 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 no. That's just flat out truth. Okay, so I asked each one of you to bring along a a peeve, a thought um, about that you hear often about. That was Donald Trump calls us the blacks, <laughs> <laughs> and and just give us some of your thoughts about a prevailing thing that may go on that you think is not true. Dustin, I'm gonna start with you since you're our guest pundit. That besides we're... dancing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that somehow we're intellectually inferior. Oh, was... um, so as we have a couple educators and Rogers <laughs> is uh, a great dad. Uh, so that, that one pisses me off. And the one that uh, black men are not good fathers mm-hmm. um, because I'm sitting with two of them. Uh, and I, from personal experience, I'm not doing, saying that because they're here. I know it from personal observation. Um, and so, yeah, y- those are the ones that get the, the press. So when we honor... Uh, like with the 200 plus, they honor the the young men. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing but fathers in that place. So it's not just all black moms with their sons getting a scholarship. It's it's dads too. Mm-hmm. So that one, uh, those two, the one, uh, I don't know. You recall William Shockley? Yes. Who that is? Mm-hmm. And where he wrote the book about yeah. our inferiority. Yes. Um, uh, according to him, uh, that somehow we're less smart. And if mm-hmm. if if you have some Caucasian blood in you, you get a little bit smarter. <laughs> Uh, that that's I, I'm almost quoting it verbatim. So those are the things that that bother me. That I sit here as a Stanford graduate. Uh, I sit here with a master's degree, um, and I didn't get it playing basketball or any other sport. I got it because I studied hard and I had the capacity to not only uh, be admitted to Stanford but finish on time. You know, I did. I had the pleasure of um, interviewing Clay Jenkinson um, as Thomas Jefferson with the Jefferson Hour uh, recently. And one of the things that we talked about as Mr. Jefferson and I mm-hmm. talked about was the fact that um, how he would always ask our blacks to prove that they accomplished something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he would say he would call his other white friends and say, well, Either they have more white blood in them, or they got some help from a, from someone else right. who was black. So even or even affirmative action, they got in mm-hmm. undeservedly, which is sort of the assumption when you think of affirmative action. Mm-hmm. Bill, some of your thoughts? No, it's really simple: is that blacks don't love America, that we haven't uh, contributed to the success and the wholesomeness and the values and the faith and and all of those things that from the very beginning we've shed our blood, we've died, we've toiled, we've slaved, we've took it all. Mm-hmm. And we took it all with a humanity where we knew we were wrong. And uh, a lot of folks on the other side don't see that and they don't hear that. But they, they don't even want to measure it. But every, every Amer- African-American I know from the worst liberal to the highest right-wing fanatical, 
We all love America. We all love our faith. We all love our families. And a lot of times when you just want to go to sleep and think about it, night, you have a tear in your eye. I love this country. I love where I am. I love these people. But these people don't love me back. Mm -hmm. And actually, they hurt me be, just for being, like Delcino just said, for being good, to get into Stanford or my sisters, my family, get into all these schools based upon their talent. Why don't you love me the way I love you? And then they take it and turn it against us when we rebel, not out of hating America, but by hating the treatment, the toils that we have to do, the battles unnecessarily that we have to fight, that we've won. And I can give you a thousand cases. Or if you are a great leader, and we have good leaders in the education communities and business communities, these people, they, they don't give them the same respect that they give other people who have not toiled a tenth of what these people have put up. So my issue is we do love America. America, all we want is some love back we, it, because we, we've, we, 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 more than any people on the face of this earth other than the American Indian, mm -hmm. have given everything to this country, everything. And still you can't go to a hospital with medically trained doctors. We know they're not scientists. They use scientists things, <laughs> to treat us. Fair. And our kids are dying. I lost a child because of an incompetent doctor who I decided to use in a very affluent neighborhood in, 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 in Cleveland, Shaker Heights, instead of going back and dealing with an African-American who understood our pain. And they literally didn't understand my wife's pain. And we literally lost a child because of that. Mm -hmm. Carol. Yeah. I think mine is very connected to yours because I hear black people don't read. Well, I'm with a lot of young people who read things that are outside the classroom. And in fact, they say, oh, Ms. Bretlow, have you read? Um, go to Barnes & Noble or go to this store and they'll have it. Um, I think that now this generation, you all have your devices, and a lot of times they are reading on those devices, and the assumption that they, that they don't read because they don't have a book is totally erroneous. Mm -hmm. The other side of it is, and yesterday in one of my classes, um, uh, State Senator Ken Alexander was mm -hmm. there, and he was talking about some of the issues of the Norfolk community. And he said he was astounded by the questions he got about the cost of things and wh who's going to pay for this. So th we have that myth that they are not analytical thinkers. They are. Mm -hmm. And that just bothers me, you mm -hmm. know, because they don't memorize things. Why should they memorize stuff that they can read about, that they can analyze, that they can apply? That bothers me. Roger. Uh, uh, two things that, that jumped out to me. One, that we're, uh, as a people, incapable of being political leaders, mm -hmm. of being uh, running cities and, and states and, and the nation. And uh, I think that now that we've had those chances, we've proved that we can be just as capable or just as corrupt as uh, the whites who were predecessors. And, uh, you know, power, money they corrupt and it takes a certain type of individual regardless of race to either you know deal with that and turn it away or to grab it with both fistfuls um so there's that and then the second thing that uh we can be as uh, african americans we can be athletes but little else and uh I always get a kick when I see that somebody goes to, um, I, I like this NCAA commercial that was a few years back about all the people who go to school and then they, uh, they major in something that's not sports. And you show the, uh, uh, all the different areas that we as athletes, we can go through school, but we can then do just a whole host of other things. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, we know there are problems among our race. We know that we have too many children growing up without two parents. We know that statistically we are overrepresented in the criminal justice system and that we kill each other with brutal efficiency. We know that. So uh, some of the myths come from, from these threads and from these strains. And I think the important thing is to 
you know, say it's not always everybody, again, 40 million people. So there are all different types of things that go into that 40 million. So it sometimes doesn't feel like the, the black community is always Where is that black community, by the way, <laughs> is always swept with a with a broad brush, no matter what. And particularly if it's a negative statistic. But, uh, well, here's sure. here's one I want to ask you guys about. So last time for the past two presidential elections, President Obama, an African-American man, has been in the office. Massive voting from the black community. Was it only because he was black? Uh, I would say 80 percent. At least. I- and so you don't think that this year we're going to get the same kind kinds of numbers? I, I, don't or... think, I don't think there's going to be the same enthusiasm. As you know, Most usually 92% in the presidential election goes for more, Democrats. But was, but was it more historical and the reason why they voted? Or I was it more def- be simply because he's black? Well, in other words, the, that first... the myth being that, that if, a black, if it's a black person, every black person is going to follow along. In 08, that was true. Because that, that, it was historical, historical and he was yeah. black, and but he was capable. Um, the and, best candidate. And, yeah, he, yeah, he was the better candidate. And, and yeah, and look who he was running against Gets, in 2000. Yeah. Yes, exactly. he had, you know, he had, and weak competition yeah. helps. But I think that for your question about the black community, yeah, I think they saw a black man up there. Regardless, he was a true African American because he's part Kenyan mm-hmm. and part American. <laughs> um, so he he represented so much, and I think the the proudest time was when. We had uh, the older people, like in their 80s and Mm -hmm. 90s, who got to see it, it. Mm -hmm. and they thought they'd never see it. Mm -hmm. So I think there were so many things, and not only that, but he got young blacks to vote, which is not not a not a uh, dependable block in regular times, let alone when a black candidate runs. But he got young people to uh, to really go in and uh, execute their civic responsibility for the first time for many. And not because they just turned 18, but many had had voted, had registered for the first time. Absolutely. And I thought yeah. that was significant, that he got people who didn't care about the system before, and now mm-hmm. they found someone that they had that, that motivated them to do that, to, where people died and bled and were, and were killed for us to have the right to vote uh, less than, what, two generations ago. Mm-hmm. So, go ahead, Bill. No, 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 I, I just agree. I, I just think he, first of all, he was a better candidate. People were tired of the war. <laughs> I was most definitely tired of the war. We were lied to about the war, too many of our... Brothers and sisters and kin have died and been wounded for that, and we need to move on. So, so th- no, all right. Let's take the current. And Carol, you're the political scientist <laughs> on the on the on the bench here. But so, as we look at this upcoming election, if more black people or, or as many black people don't vote, is it simply because there are no black candidates, or is it because of of uh, other reasons? Maybe they're not happy with the with the choices. I think it's for other reasons, and I've done an informal poll on campus to find out that people are, (laughs) I don't want to say discouraged, but they look at who is there. Trump, nobody, he's not focusing on issues. Even if you disagree with his perspective, if he would focus on issues and talk about the pros and cons, that's not happening. They look at Hillary Clinton. There is some history there. There is some... Reticence because they said, well, is she just jumping on the bandwagon now because she needs the vote and she's kind of dovetailing into what Obama has done? Um, they see her as opportunistic and they're discouraged. Saunders, philosophically good. But, but you're saying they're, they're still that they're, they're interested, interested enough to but know they, And there what are the organizations are. that are very much committed to getting students involved and the students themselves are registering people to vote or going to people and asking them to vote. So. Okay, Roger. Yeah, and, and with the current crop of candidates, you see some that are more populist in, in Trump exactly. and Sanders, but when you dig down into what they it's say that they'll do, true. there seems to be little, uh, Mustard. just little sense of reality <laughs> in what they're yeah. planning. Yeah. And for the more sober ones, they don't just generate the the same type of enthusiasm. And I think that that's really going to be a problem if uh, Hillary wins the Democratic nomination. That, you know, uh, is she going to be able to generate some of the turnout she's going to need in some states that have been purple the past couple of elections? Mm -hmm. Are they going to fall out of the Democratic category? And I think that you're you're seeing some of that uh, fear actually going on right now. And the Republicans, they just think that while Trump is very, uh, you know, he's getting a plurality in many of the states, 
he's going to really kill them in some of the down ballot uh, races because they might not get the same type of turnout they need to hold on to some of the Senate and some of the House. Mm -hmm. Let me bring up one thing. Will uh, Leviste, um could not be with us today. He was traveling, but he did send me a note Will. about, uh, about yeah. what his thoughts were. And he said, one of the many myths is that blacks have a monopoly on not supporting each other as a racial ethnic group. We often hear that blacks don't or can't back each other like the Jews or Asians, et cetera, and so on. But there's no, his quote, black self-hate gene, which is what racism would have all Americans believe. The truth is that inflighting ex um, exploitation and scamming classism, sexism, discrimination exists among all peoples. It's a human trait. What is not a myth is that too many blacks have internalized this false crabs in a barrel belief mm. themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? We got three minutes left. You agree with them? Disagree I, well, with there is it? no gene, that's for sure. Uh, so yeah, I agree on that. Uh, but there, I think yeah, we have our own stereotypes within our community too. So uh, we're not immune to it. Um, and there is that 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 um, concept of um, being a hater. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I dealt with that growing up, and we didn't call it that then. Um, um, now we call it bullying, uh, yeah. where if I the way I speak now versus like this. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was called acting white mm -hmm. and it's somehow that that was not a good thing and um, I just I, I was blessed to have a strong mother who encouraged me to continue to pursue excellence and for some reason I uh, uh, not as much now that I'm older but excellence somehow was equated to being white yeah. and I just don't buy into that but too many do um, it's great to be a wonderful Michael Jordan basketball player. That's fine because he's a basketball player, but he's a businessman too. The man's a billionaire, not because of the basketball. Well, basketball helped, but the fact that he's a that he owns a team. So I like this. I, I really had some notes here about the business side mm -hmm. because a, because that takes a certain amount of skill uh, that that transcends race. Uh, you know, Rogers wrote, written many columns about the, those kinds of success stories. You don't have to be, whether you're uh, run a barber shop or a billion dollar company. Um, we still have that skill set. We still come from good stock. All of us are here mm -hmm. on in this in this country because we come from good stock. They survived the Middle Passage. They survived slavery. They survived Jim Crow, and we are their descendants. I think we owe them to be excellent because they sacrificed so much like for us. Author. Absolutely. So. And Delcino Miles, our mm -hmm. guest pundit, you got the last word yeah. this time around. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> so very Just make much. my check payable to Delcino Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know I'm doing this for community service. <laughs> Something else black folks do. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be right back. <laughs> Amen. Okay. I am Brother Cornell West, and when I'm in Hampton Roads, I make it a point to listen to another view with my dear sister Barbara Ham Lee on WHRV FM. Brother Cornell West, you didn't know that one, huh, Dulcina? Uh, okay, how much you get paid? <laughs> he didn't get paid either. <laughs> this is public radio. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. Like us on Facebook, and I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week on Another View, meet the new police chief of Portsmouth, Chief Tanya Chapman. It's also your chance to support another another view by becoming a member support what you love our spring membership drive starts tomorrow and this coming monday april the 11th don't miss the latest ken burns documentary jackie robinson the story of the man who broke the color line in baseball it starts monday at nine on whro tv 15 our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer. And Melanie Booth answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fabulous weekend, everyone. Let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.